Uh, there's a fair amount of things that we could cover tonight. I'd like to start off with a continuation of last week, and um, let's see where it goes with that. Last week, if you remember, we spoke about the idea that that essentially there, there's sin and there's punishment, and then there are certain times where the punishment cannot be uh, cannot be how do you say cannot be uh, explained. There's no cause and effect. The punishment was much too much for the sin. And then we say that there are certain things which are beyond not only human reason, but even Torah reason. And even the Torah would not say about this, this punishment. However, obviously, there's an author of the Torah. So there's what we call a Tom Komos, a hidden, a hidden um, reason or shtoik. Be quiet. This, is, this arose in my thought. But as a general rule, of course, there's this concept of sin and punishment. So Egon wanted to know a little bit more about that. But I want to say, so then talking about, in particular about the Holocaust, the Rebbe's approach was that we're not allowed to justify it in any way. And for that reason, we also should not threaten a person that if you do this and this action, you will bring, heaven forbid, a Holocaust. Because the Holocaust cannot be explained in terms of, like they didn't keep Shabbos, so therefore this that happened. So today, if we don't keep Shabbos, it will happen. We, we can't. We cannot say that. But uh, the bigger, uh, I don't know the word is question, but the bigger issue really was, I think that ego ego sort of asked me was, the approach. Is it true that Chabad just whitewashes everything? In other words. What? And that always that, <laughs> make it that like, like we we never tell a person there's going to be a punishment, you know. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. yeah. So let me talk a tiny bit about this, okay? The, for you, all I have to give is one line as an answer, and it should resolve all of your thing. When it comes to yourself, you could use the idea of reward and punishment as an incentive. When it comes to someone else. Almost always, that should not be the incentive. So it's like this: if I want to eat not kosher, right? God forbid. So I could, I could scare myself, which is, you think God's going to let me go away with this? So and then you know I'm going to get an ulcer, or something terrible will happen, whatever it might be, or I'll burn in hell. Any 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 method, and it's all true, by the way. Anything that will help you keep away from sin is worthwhile. On the most elementary level, not even a religious level, is people will find out about it. You know, and then you'll be ashamed, you'll be embarrassed, and so on. And that's a very effective way of keeping away from sin. But you'll realize that that becomes less effective to someone else. So... If, let's say, someone else is doing a sin, you know, you shouldn't do that. People might find out about it. It's going to be, he said, I thought about it already. You know what I mean? I already factored that in, and I, I can live with it, and, and so on. So, again, when it, this is the one line. When it comes to, there is such a thing called sin equals punishment or consequence. And I, be, this is a true statement. And it is especially effective in helping a person follow the right path. And that's why I said, even, even the basic idea that people might find out is a very effective thing. However, when it comes to someone else, the, as I just pointed out, the effectiveness is minimized. And especially if you want to get a person to do Torah and mitzvahs and telling him, if you don't do the Torah and mitzvahs, you'll get punished by God, even if that statement is true, it, the, uh, the Chabad approach is that this is, should not be your first approach, even not the second approach, it's a last approach. Why? So, <clears throat> let, me, let me point out another thing. When we talk about punishment, right, the word punishment in English, or in this world, um, has one type of a connotation which does not apply in heaven. By us, most of the time when we talk about punishment, 
In English, the word is vindictive. It's like taking revenge. You did something wrong, uh, and it's not right. You, should, you shouldn't get away with it, and therefore you should pay for your sins. The whole concept of the Western concept of justice is based on it, and, it, and it's seriously flawed. So if a person stole um, $1,000, so you should not get away with that. So therefore, what will we do? We'll put you in prison for six months, and all of society you'll be stealing from. Because now we have to keep you in prison. Yeah. Okay. Plus, you're going to come out worse than when you came in. But, I mean, in other words, if you thought about it, it doesn't make any sense. So why do we give this punishment? Well, he, it's, it's almost like a response of anger. He, he doesn't deserve to have it off easy. You cause this guy pain, you have to feel the pain, even if ultimately the pain that the guy is feeling is not helpful. Not to him and not to society. Most punishment is on that line. But Hashem never punishes out of vindicativeness. Why? Because Hashem is the source of goodness. Hashem is the source of kindness. So what, what, So it bothers Hashem that you had a little bit of pleasure from eating ham? He, he essentially, God is good-natured enough that if you want to enjoy a delicious gefilte fish, enjoy it, gesundheit. hate. And just because you ate ham, what he's concerned is not the enjoyment that you had of it. The punishment of Hashem is that when you ate the ham, when you ate the not kosher, what happened was that your neshama, your soul, which is a part of God, was impacted negatively. So we could liken it to the idea of uh, something very clean that has gotten dirty. The punishment is not to punish you because you had so much pleasure. The punishment is meant to cleanse the soul. That's true about punishments on earth, and it's especially even more true on punishments in heaven. So what we call um, Gehenna, or in English, hell, or purgatory, and stuff like that, in the Goyesha, uh, especially Christian thing, it's like, ha, ha, ha. We're going to get you back. You thought you could outsmart us? No. Just wait and, and fear, and you'll burn. How long? Until the devil is happy. You know, something like that. In Yiddishkeit, it's like this. You, you live this world, and now the Neshama comes home, and to heaven, and Hashem wants to welcome the Neshama back to Gan Eden. However, he says to the Neshama, I can't let you enter Gan Eden for the simple reason that A, you won't appreciate it, so there's no reward. You deserve a reward for the good that you did, but you're not going to appreciate it in Gan Eden. In addition to which, you actually have a very offensive smell around you, so you're going to bother the other Neshamas there. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do for your benefit. I'll cleanse you. So now when you go into Ganeidin, you will be able to appreciate Ganeidin. So the punishment essentially is not only to cleanse the soul, but it's actually an act of kindness. So if, for example, uh, just, just for argument's sake, a kid comes in from playing, right, and he's filthy, and he sits down for dinner, and his mother says, no dinner for you, you go upstairs, you wash your hands and your face and change your garments. He says, mom, hungry. Go upstairs and do that. The purpose that she's doing it for, she might have many other reasons, but the simplest is, number one, there are germs. You don't want to spread the germs. Number two, you probably won't uh, uh, appreciate dinner the way in your mindset. That's then if, if you feel clean yourself up for dinner, that itself prepares you to enjoy dinner. Incidentally, we all do this whenever we go out to a fancy restaurant. So almost everyone changes their clothes, you know what I mean? Takes a shower, gives a little spritz of cologne, all, all these silly things. What does that have to do with food? Nothing of it has to do with food. Food goes into your mouth. 
So why is it important for you that you should be wearing a white shirt and your wife gets off up with all dressed up so beautiful? The answer is that the food tastes better now. <laughs> How could the food taste better? So the answer is not really the food tastes better, but you've created an environment where the food can be appreciated. So this idea of, of punishment on earth is, again, vindictive. It's retribution. It's to cause you and to inflict pain because you don't deserve. In contrast, to make a separation between uh, foolishness and holiness, in contrast to heaven, where all punishment, without, exce without <coughs> exception, all punishment is not to punish, it's to cleanse, it's to, to clean, it's to enable, it's a step in something greater. What happens now? So let's use, a, let's use the famous parable that punishment is like cleaning a garment, okay? So if you have a beautiful suit, right, and you want to wear the suit, essentially what you want to do is um, keep it clean. If it got very dirty and, and it's filled with perspiration, so you give it to a dry cleaner. Okay. What happens if you see a person um, ruining his suit? No, he's eating, but he's, it's dripping all over his suit. And you want to tell him he's ruining his suit. What are you going to say? You can, you can choose one and two. One is, you know, you've got such a beautiful suit. You look so handsome and so nice and everything else. Don't ruin it. Or you could say, it's going to cost you at least $40 in, 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 in to dry clean it. If you talk about the dry cleaning, you're basically not talking about the suit at all. You're just concerned. Okay. If you talk about the suit, if you're reminding him how special he looks in the suit and how special the suit is as well. When a person does a sin, what should he be worried about? He shouldn't be worried about dry cleaning. He should be worried about the suit. In other words, if a person, using that example I gave before, a person ate not kosher, deliberately. So, afterwards, what should bother him? Oh, boy. Now there's a stain on my soul, and I have to go to hell? One second, going to hell will take out the stain. What are you worried about? <clears throat> what should really be bothering you is that you made the stain. What, what most of us are frightened of is the cleaning. Let's try this again in a different example. Let's say there's a kid, right? Um, it's snowing outside. And he wants to go out dressed like it's summer. So you say, don't go out like that. He says, leave me alone. I want to go out like this. No, no, don't go out. You, you might get sick. I don't care. You'll have to go to the doctor. Oh, 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 okay. I'll put it on. What is he frightened of? Not the sickness. He's frightened of the cure. Which, which, is, which, is, which is foolish. The doctor is, is your friend in this sense. He wants you to stay healthy. What, why should you not go outside in the winter wearing shorts? Because you might get sick. For certain people, that's not enough. For them, what frightens them is the cure. You might have to go to the doctor. But you can understand that going, but using the doctor who's the cure as a way of frightening you ha has a, a type of a negative connotation of what is a doctor. So now whenever you go to a doctor, even to get immunized, you know, for a flu or something like that, you're frightened. Because that's the guy that's going to hurt me. So let's go over this one more time. Sin to the neshama is either making it dirty or making it sick. Punishment to the neshama is making it healthy, making it clean. Mm. When people frighten a Jew into doing mitzvahs and to doing tshuva, by frightening him, if you don't do teshuva, you're going to burn in Gehenna or something like that, what they're really doing is they're frightening him about the cure. They're saying, if you don't take care of yourself, you'll have to go to the doctor, which to a certain extent also makes it that God is a bad guy or a bad creator. Chabad's approach has always been talk to a person how precious the suit he's wearing. 
talk to a person how precious the neshama he has. So if you, a person is not keeping Shabbos, instead of saying, if you don't keep the Shabbos, without a doubt, you, your house will burn down. You know, instead of saying that, you say, if you don't keep the Shabbos, you're going to be denying yourself immense pleasure. If you don't keep the Shabbos, you're never going to really feel good about who you are. If you don't keep the Shabbos, chances are you're going to lose control of your life. In other words, what we're trying to emphasize is how precious Shabbos is. We're not trying to frighten the Jew into how bad God is. And that's an important distinction, I, I believe, mm -hmm. between the approach of, in general of Hasidus. I, I say Chabad, but now it's really it's more of a Hasidic approach in contrast to more of what they call a Lithuanian approach. The Thwaini approach or the Musa approach is emphasize the punishment. And that's effective. It is effective. You can't say it's not effective. It's effective. But it comes at an expense. You understand what the expense of it is? You're forced into the mitzvah because the alternative is terrible. In contrast to do the mitzvah because it is so precious. So what about if I don't do the mitzvah? So you're going to be avoiding this precious thing and, and you're going to resent it and, and, and regret it. If all fails, that's when you talk about the punishment. You understand? But it's not your first or even second. It's actually the last, the last reason. When it comes to, though, uh, in general, when it comes to telling a person that if you don't put on tefillin, you're going to get a stroke, you know, something like that. Over, over here, the very fact that you say stuff, if you remember from last week, last week I told you, how can you say something like that? Because God doesn't only measure the action, but what went in that action, right? Remember, I, thought, I was speaking about that. So a person showing up on Yom Kippur might get a lot of, much more reward than you think. So when they make fun of this, right, the... You know, the, the, the Yisker Jew, the Rebbe said, how precious he is. But if, there's another thing as well. And this leads us to the concept of the power of speech. And we've touched upon this many times. And, uh, you know, each time it could be a whole, a whole rush, really. But essentially, language is very powerful in creating something. I don't have to prove it to you because we all see this every single day. If someone says something nice to you, they, the expression is you could build up a person with, with words, right? And you could destroy a person's ego, a person's feeling with words. If you like to read, right? You could get so involved, you're reading about a world that's non-existent. But you're crying, you're, you're identifying with, with, with the characters. It's an amazing concept the power of words to create. We have a teaching that says, Al Tiftach Peh This is a really important teaching. I'll say it again in Hebrew and then translate it. Al Tiftach Peh which means, one is forbidden to open up his mouth to the Satan. Now this is, believe it or not, is a law in the Shulchan Aruch. So there's one law in the Shulchan Aruch in particular, which says, for example, never threaten a child that if he doesn't do something, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a dog will come mm -hmm. or a wolf will come and, and bite him because this is the words of the Shulchan Aruch, the Shulchan Aruch Harab, actually, that there are angels and demons which are likened to, and they're big, they're, they're like the negative energies. And if you say that a dog will come and bite you, what you're inviting is, <clears throat> to put it loosely, this negative energy, mm -hmm. which is a spiritual reality, to come and, 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 and bring some negativity and even a harm to your child. But our Tipsach Pelasotan goes all the way back. There's a famous teaching that the Talmud quotes the prophet Isaiah. And we're talking about Yeshayo Anavi living in the first temple, a person who had visions of the divine chariot. So we're talking about a perfect Sadiq. When, he, when Hashem told him that he should go to the Jewish people and, and tell them that they should do Teshuvah because they're not acting appropriately, he basically said, they're a bunch of sinners. 
They won't even listen to me. And then, because he said that, the response was, the bunch of sinners, I will make them like Sodom, which basically means I will destroy them completely. And partially because Yeshayo Anavi said that they were sinners, which brought the response that if they're really sinners, then they should be like Sodom, mm-hmm. he actually, as you know, Yeshayo Anavi did not have a normal death. He had a Misa Mashuna. He was, he was killed by an axe mm-hmm. by, by, the, by the king Menasha. As a punishment in heaven, or as an atonement in heaven, for having spoken what he spoke. When people say things like, you know, if the Jewish people don't do tshuva, you know, what's happening in Israel is just a small thing. Just wait. Mm -hmm. Just wait and see, you know. Mm -hmm. That's saying those words, even if technically it's true. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's something to be said about that. But just saying the words, in a sense, creates the climate for it to happen. And I can explain it in two different ways. I'll explain it one way very easily. In heaven, one of our, our, our firm teachings is what we do on earth has an effect in heaven. So, for example, think about this for a moment. A person, let's say, um, let's say a person is, uh, has meat, okay, has, doing a meat dish, and uh, by mistake, he thought he put in margarine, but he found out that it wasn't. It was O U D. It was actually dairy. So he put a little piece of little margarine into this big stew. Okay? So the person calls up the rabbi. What should I do? Should I throw it out? Am I allowed to eat it? And the rabbi says, Well, uh, was it hot? Was it cold? How much was it? Let's make believe. The rabbi says, It seems to me. I'm sorry. You'll have to throw out. Throw it out. Right? So we're talking about dinner. We're talking about maybe seventy, eighty dollars worth of meat. We're, we're we're talking about the embarrassment. His mother-in-law is coming. We can't eat. eat you know, well, why do we say? Why do we listen to throw it out? Because basically, this food is 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 forbidden to eat. If you eat this food, you will be removed from God. What happens if he says, "Oh"? It's okay, it's bottle bashishim, shasat chak, it's time and necessity, you may use it. Suddenly, it comes into your body. Now, what happens if in heaven they know it's really trafe? Well, you just said it's a law. It's kind of the answer is it's not, it's not really trafe. Whatever the rabbi <laughs> Paskins, that's what Heavenly Court says. Gotcha. So, 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 in other words, it, 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 he says it's 60. Right. What happens if he made a mistake? It really wasn't 60, it was really 58. It's rabbi's fault. It's the rabbi's fault. A- agreed. But you rely on them. Right? But we rely on them. Yeah. What, what that basically means, though, is that in the heavenly court, they, follow. they, they followed follow his the halacha. Mm-hmm. So how does it affect... So what we see from here is just the simple reality of earth has an effect in heaven. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now imagine if, 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 if the, in the heavenly court, and of course when this is mundane, now it's coarse, the words are not refined, but for now. Let's say in the heavenly court, the prosecuting angel called the Satan. We don't, many Jews don't even like to say the word Satan. They say the, the, the other angel or the whatever, or the Shindalit, whatever they call them. But anyway, let's say the prosecuting angel gets up there and says, uh, Almighty God, I know the Torah. And I, this man, Yankel Lovich, has not followed the law, and according to your law, he is supposed to be stricken with poverty. So, allow me to put into his mind that he should take all of his money, put it into the stock market, and he's gonna, and then the next day he'll lose everything. Okay, that's what he says to the heavenly court. So the heavenly court says, well, we have to look up, uh, maybe there's uh, so, some leniency over here. Maybe we could find a reason to, to minimize the judgment. And as they're saying that, comes Rabbi uh, so-and-so from this yeshiva, and he gets up there and he says, you know, for people who don't do this and this, according to Jewish law, they should lose all their money. And suddenly the sudden says, <coughs> you see, 
E even the rabbis agree with me. I mean, we always listen to the rabbis, don't we? Yeah. The rabbis said, this is what should happen. And that's what it means. When you open up your mouth, you're actually supporting the sudden. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you say, I hope this guy gets into a car crash, just saying that oh, means that, it ha not that you can make him go into a car, you can't do anything, your words. But what happens is, in the heavenly court, they look at the guy driving the car. Does he deserve to get there? Or maybe he deserves to get into a car crash. And then suddenly, the sins in heaven, plus your invitation, cause, God forbid, a disaster. Mm. So that's the idea that even when there is something about Musr, where there's a concept of, if you don't do Torah Mitzvahs, you're going to be punished, and therefore do Torah Mitzvahs to avoid the punishment, you have to be very, very careful how you say it. So how do you explain to you know, I mean, I think it happens in the past, a big rebellion, right? Really disagreed. I mean, because of yeah. the sake of an argument, there's like, for example, the rebel used to do, right? It's to say that openly, you know, something, let's say, open my mouth. It says that. So what, I mean, they, like, so, probably know, so what right. does it mean, really? So what we'll have to say, is one of a couple of possibilities. Well, maybe like, you know, what? like against like hundreds of years ago, right? What? Against Hasidim and whatever. Okay. Like, uh, I know that that's something else. That's something else. So it's not the same. That's not the same thing. But it's not like you're let, let me, like uh, no. But let me explain. Oh, it's not the same. Not necessarily, no. But let, but like how put do you, in like I mean, for example, like uh, you know, you know that, like put in like outer to the prison, or you know, it's not the same as you said, like. Uh, Somebody wears like an extra mile, you know, say something against him. No? I don't understand what you're saying. No, you just said like here, if you do something, he right. brings, you know, Let's if you say something he against another Jew or whatever it is, you bring like a support or, you know, Correct. Or right. See, actually, you actually are waiting right. judgment. So, support of punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. So, I mean, it, it's not, but so, at the same time you said like if, like, for example, like, uh, you know, on this video, so like, I see them try to, you know, just, establish their presence here, okay. you know, simulate whatever it is, uh, decisions. So at the same time, um, Ms. Nagy, my opponent, tries to be talking bad about them Correct. in person. So, so they were wrong. That's the answer. But I understand it's, it's, but it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but it's not the, the same. But it's not. The question is not the same like you say, something you give a support to, you know, whatever is happening in heaven. So somebody goes to prison. So the answer is they were wrong. Okay. They were wrong. They were wrong. But another so way to say it is as follows. So Not, an, another way to explain it is that if the people that said it were truly great people, mm -hmm. they realized that there was no other way. In other words, it, it, in other words, instead of saying to their people that you know uh, you should go to the Vilna Goyim better than the Alter Rebbe, they had to say it. If you go to the Alter Rebbe, this and this will happen to you. You know what I'm saying? Because they they felt that there was no other way. But in general, like when you read about the people of old that gave Musa and actually said, if you don't do tshuva, there'll be this. Like, like the story of Jonah. If you guys don't do tshuva, the Nineveh will be turned over, right? Mm -hmm. So he threatened them, and three days later, it didn't happen because they did tshuva. That's because they knew there was no alternative. Okay. So if, if he would have gone and said to the people of Nineveh, they were going anyway, he said... All of you should do teshuva and God will smile upon you and give you all paradise. None of them would have done teshuva. So there is a time when the only effective way is... Yeah. So basically, I mean, like many times, if, 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 if a person's in love with a shiksa, well, what are you going to say? You know, you should really keep away from her and you'll get a big reward. That's not going to work. And nothing really will work, but, but it's much more effective by saying the truth. And that is, look... You want to give your father a heart attack? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I happen to love. I happen to love my father. But but that's what, that's it. That's a, that's that's going to be more effective. That's that's going to be more. That that will be more effective. You understand? So there are times when you have to use it. So what will it happen? Okay, let's say for the argument's sake, this is the alternative. Mm, There's no other way. That's the only way you, you can say, say it. Right. So it doesn't have effect over there. Sure it has. Well, it does. Sure yeah. yeah, I mean, basically, negative, I mean, negative basically effect, right? when you, when, God forbid, if you negative. say something like, you know, if, you, if you're going to take this non-Jew, your mother is going to crack up, just saying it already creates 
a, a, a bad energy. Even if even if you're successful and they and they stop. But today, and, and that's where again what what comes into play is we're chasidim. I I don't know how to say this clear enough. Being a chassid doesn't only mean drinking vodka. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> In other words, being a chassid basically means following a rebbe. So when it comes to what we call outreach, I'm using very broad things. When we're talking about outreach, what is the best way for outreach? The answer is we ask our rebbe. In fact, the whole idea of outreach to a certain extent, originated from our Rebbe. Everyone was, is, 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 you know, was pretty much influenced by the Rebbe and to a certain extent imitated the Rebbe. So now we have three different, we have the Asia Torah approach, we have the Chabad approach, we have, uh, I forget his name, the guy who makes all the people cut off their, 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 their ponytails approach. No, no, no. no, no, no guy who, what's his name? Uh, Yitzchak, uh, Am- Yitzchak uh, Amron. Amron, whatever. Yeah. I listened to a couple of stuff. Powerful words, you know. Every one of them is, this is terrible stuff is going to happen. Every one of them has it. And he scares people. And, and he claims to have many made Baal Shuvah. Oh, without attacking him, which I would love to do, and his Baal Shuvah, <laughs> it's not important. What's more important is, we have a rebel. Our Rebbe taught us how to do things. So the fact that he has an approach which might or might not work is irrelevant to us. So again, can you remind yeah. me again? So, so what is it? Like, again, the, of, the, uh, the, Chabad versus like, so, so the approach side. of Chabad in order to encourage another person to do, to do Teshuvah is not to emphasize that if he doesn't do Teshuvah, he will be punished. Yeah. The Chabad approach has always been and continues to be yeah, emphasizing the, the so goodness of mitzvahs and the specialness of neshama. So Igor says, but it sounds like when you only use that approach, people lose sight of that there's really going to be a punishment. Mm-hmm. Actually, so, I, I mean, I just want to say that if you, it's funny. I mean, not funny, but like the kind of to, to support that. I mean, it, it surprises so many quote unquote, so to say, bad people went to Habari just because somebody told them, you're not bad, it's okay, you're still welcome. So they kind of felt like you feel like uh, that you've been left out by the whole, and nobody wants you because, like, you're bad, you know, we don't want you. Mm-hmm. So I said, I don't care, you're a Jew. So a lot of people kind of change, mm-hmm. and I mean, you can yeah. see it with all this, like, I'm not talking like, about you know, approach, approach is I'm not correct. Not right, so it's whole, exactly. it's, 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 acceptance based say, like, yeah. I have a Israel. You're not saying like if you don't do it bad, it's like everybody told me that. Today. Like no, no, no. Keep Shabbos with me; it's good. Like well, so, I mean, I'm just saying. Like, so I forget. Uh, oh. No, you were saying like has to do with the approach, right? Just the difference between. Uh, yeah. Uh, we follow. I forget. Right? There was something I want to share. Okay, Nishka fella. Don't interrupt, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, interruption. Was was a, it was, was part of it. It was the question. It was speech. Oh, oh, I was going to say about, about punishment like this. Oh. That. Pun- so the qu- so Igor's point was that if you always say you're good, you're good, you're nice, they won't know about that. There's a concept of punishment. So my 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 first response to you was that. Reward and punishment is one of the integral parts of, of being a Jew. There are 13 principles of faith. But you don't have to teach a Jew the thir- uh, this principle of punishment before you teach him about believing in God. In other words, this is something that will come up. Where it's most important is to tell yourself. Mm-hmm. You understand? So if you need... Uh, if, if you have issues with Torah and mitzvahs, remind yourself that, that after 120 years, you're not going to, you're going to have to give an accounting. So that approach is more effective with you and should be used with you. But not only, you should also talk about the importance of mitzvahs. For others, you have time. And that's why I said we follow the, Reb, the Rebbe's approach about this. In general, I, I, I guess it went over you. But I, what I was trying to emphasize in the beginning was that if for a person to go back to Yiddish kind, and everything is fair. You want to use the punishment, you want to use the reward, you want to use bribery, everything is fair. But if you think about it, 
you want a person to go back to Yiddishkeit because Yiddishkeit is good. You don't want a person to go back to Yiddishkeit because he because he's running away from punishment. It's almost like a default. You know, the main thing is I don't want to get hurt. Okay, I don't want to get hurt, so I guess I'll put on film today. Yeah, I don't want to get hurt, so I, I don't want my children to be punished, you know what I mean? So, uh, so I'll do my dafyomi, I'll learn something, because I don't want my kids to suffer. So you're not serving God, really. I mean, and you're, not, you're certainly not loving Hashem. You're very focused on this idea of avoiding punishment. But if you were to put it... You know, let, let, let's now, refine it. Say, yeah. Before, before yeah. I move on, to yeah, yeah. Say, like, but you can like disagree that both ways. Yeah, sometimes right? you need both. Yeah. You can see like Eshot Torah have their ways, and um, you know whatever they're like yeah. other. Or maybe well, there's just like a time for this kind of way and a time for this. Different way. types of people. Just like I don't know, like the different types of people. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I mentioned that to the Zeb. It's very possible that cultures also have something to do. You know, mm -hmm. Americans don't like to be frightened. Oh. Maybe Russians are more into <laughs> this idea of you know they know what a gulag is. I mean, but I, I, but, I but again, it really doesn't make a difference. Because the Rebbe is our Rebbe, and he's the Rebbe of the 20th and 21st century, and he has shown us this is the way to do it, that's all. So the fact that, they, that there's other approaches doesn't mean anything for a Chabadnik. Once, once we understand that, now we can attack and see, try to measure, you know, the, what we... I, I don't think it's a secret that if we were to look in the bigger picture, of how many people have been brought back to Yiddishkeit, including ourselves in this room, the answer is it was the Chabad approach, not some, some frightening approach. Oh, it was, Chabad is everywhere, right? As we see. You yeah. don't see any, yeah, anybody I'm else like, like, like around the world, yeah. right? So it's so it's not it's like everywhere you go, people go to Chabad. They don't, they're not looking for like, oh, I'm looking like to stay for this little show, this little Chabad everywhere. So I guess it speaks for itself. It, it does speak for itself. Yeah, Even though, I, okay, now, now but we're not all, in either. Now, take, now, now we're off the subject. Yeah, but it's not that much as yeah. in, in, in our <laughs> yeah. world. Like now we're off the subject. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Israel. Israel. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. It's not that much Chabad but, in no, Israel. Israel. I mean, I don't yeah. know about Israel. Yeah. There's like, still Chabad houses in Israel, right? Ch Chabad in Israel is very different than the, oh, the yeah. reputation of Chabad in Israel is different than, than the reputation of Chabad in America and in the world wide. Uh, and not all for the better. Mm -hmm. Partially, uh, again, I, this is, uh, I finished the lecture, so to speak, about this. Now we're just schmoozing as, uh, you know. Yeah, what I'm just saying. Uh, partially because, there's a, because in America, to find dedicated Jews mm -hmm. is, is, is a rarity. In other words, mm -hmm. most Jews are very, very calm about their Judaism. Mm -hmm. You know, even those that are religious are Americanized to the extent, okay, so you don't keep Shabbos. I do keep Shabbos. Okay. You know, it's, it's fine. Israel, everything is much more intense, mm -hmm. uh, both for the positive and for the negative. Mm -hmm. But it's also more intense in Yiddishkeit. In other words, in, in, in a lot of places in Israel, people sit and study for eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. oh, so when, when, when a Chabad house or a Chabad rabbi, you, you understand, does things, like he's not studying eight hours a day. I don't know if he ever did study eight hours a day. So, they, so to begin with, they look at him differently. Yeah. You understand? Whereas over here... Rabbi Landa was a rabbi, mm -hmm. Rabbi Hecht is a rabbi, and Rabbi uh, from, from, from uh, uh, everyone's a rabbi, you know what I mean? <laughs> so this one knows more, this one knows less, the old rabbis, let, let's, let's be polite about this, you know? Mm -hmm. In Israel it's not like that, he's no rabbi, he's no rabbi, he's an Amoris, so he's a rabbi. <laughs> Just because he calls himself rabbi, that doesn't... So it's a different approach as well. Interesting enough, many of the people of Israel, he when they travel... When they travel outside of Israel, they change their whole thing. Because they see a world outside of Israel. And over there, they already see a lot of the power and, and the presence of, 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 of Lubavitch. Okay. I guess he means... Uh, what? Or he was missing... Like about Israel, like, you know. It's yeah, not important, really, because it's, it's a political thing in Israel right. also, as well. It's a hot weather, everybody in Bolin goes there. <laughs> no, 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 no
If you want it's to very popular uh, in America. The, the Chabad's house is very popular in America. Yes, because so it's, it's not so popular. It in was Israel. founded in America, right? No, founded. No. I founded in Russia, but anyway. No, I don't know. What was the first Chabad house? Is it like uh, first Chabad house was in was in California? Okay. In California, is that UCLA? Cool? Oh, no? Yeah, yeah, Gailey, LA. The second was in Berkeley. So because California, in, in Israel it's so many Shmuel confessions. Called Shmuel David in Los what? Angeles somewhere. He didn't make a Chabad house. He, he was no, a wasn't a Chabad house. house. Okay. No, he was a Shadar. I see. He went around uh, spreading, I you know, the light. So what is the reason for California? Any idea why California out of all the other places? Yeah, because Shlaim McKinnon was here. Shlaim McKinnon was... No, but he came here. A lot of Jews live here probably, right? In Los Angeles, just the second most to New York probably. Oh, really? I mean, the Chabad, yeah. you understand the Chabad house that opened opened up on campus. There were always there were other Chabad centers like in Chicago, but there was right. always shuls. Mm -hmm. You understand that's where the Chabad present was from the shul. Mm -hmm. The concept of a Chabad house oh, the, it's, it's the way, it is, right? was really mm -hmm. in California, and, and this 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 is to the everlasting credit of Rabbi Kunin. He was he's like a five star general. He started oh, yeah. this whole thing, and the Rebbe encouraged it. Mm -hmm. When they gave him, it's it's famous. When they gave him the key. And, he, and I, I think if they said it was the first Chabad house or the second Chabad house, the Rebbe gave a, a prophecy in the early 1970s. He said, there will come a time when Chabad house will be as popular as a grocery store all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they looked at him like, there's only one Chabad house. It is amazing. It's like yeah. you have Chabad house like a Starbucks. Like, uh, yeah, wherever you go, there's, there's, in there's some a kind sense, of, that's like Chaye Chamei Sim in, in some way. For sure. <laughs> The Chabad House's function. The most spiritual uh, way. The Chabad House functions in many ways like Avram Avinu did. Avram Avinu, in contrast to Yitzchak, Yitzchak stayed pretty much in Israel. Avram Avinu was the first Jew, and Avram Avinu was told to leave his household. You have to remember when he left, he actually left a place where he, he was quite prominent. It's not like he didn't do anything in Mesopotamia. He did. He had students, and the famous story that he was thrown into the mm -hmm. to the fire, oh, well, and he came out. <laughs> so basically, he, he was a celebrity. So it's not like he wasn't doing things. But the Rebbe, uh, but Hashem said, that's not where you have to stay. You have to travel. And we always find our own traveling. He never stops traveling. And what does he do? Wherever he goes, he disseminates, he, he publicizes the name of Hashem. So in many, many ways, in other words, if you had to look at a model amongst the, the seven shepherds of Israel, who, who Chabad house models after, or Chabad, the, the answer is really Avram Avinu. Because the, one of the few places where it actually talks about him having influence over people is through a meal, you know, with the, with the angels. Of course, they were angels, but some say it wasn't angels. The point of it is, he invited people to eat. You know, and, and, and that becomes... Yeah, so basically, this concept of being Makar of a Jew through his stomach is... Uh, well, again, this is, it's, it's a new concept that Avon Avinu taught the world. I'm, I totally... You know, I remember, like, for Russia, it's like, uh, if you can find, like, a Russian kid and say, like, if you don't put it film, you'll be part of like, you know what? I'm sorry, screw you. I don't <laughs> go. It was like, come, let's make a lachaim. Well, this 20 years old yeah. kid now, I need some like in front of right. like, like 10, 12 kids. Mm -hmm. Just looking like, like you know, wow. in a, around the world, something like in front of someone, wow. you know. If you have like 20 years kids, like, let's sit down, make a lachaim. So you, I, I remember it's like, you come and like you eat, you make a lachaim, so you yeah. have a friend, you say, like, it's not bad. <laughs> No, it's not eventually, that, eventually, it actually, it it actually changes a person when, when, when yeah, people eat like together, it changes like them. Bad. It's like, no, you're good. It's the yeah, you're not, yeah, they the say, like, you're even better than I am, because look at you. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, born in Brandon Crown Heights, right. yeah. and you look at you, you make a breeze, you put a fill in, you live with this, you feel like, wow, you know, somebody, <laughs> you feel something. But uh, it's, it's, it's still good. a lot of people are, Honestly, have no idea. They say, okay, it doesn't matter if you, you know, Keep the Jewish law. If doesn't keep the law, you go straight to the to heaven. heaven. That's it. You know That's something? It. First of all, you don't know if they won't. Maybe they will. Because, okay. he's, because again, because it's really very hard. For you, Not very hard. It's impossible to actually measure where a person goes. 
And the second thing is, so what? So they think like that. It's a matter of because education. The, uh, of ignorance, yeah. Yeah, so it's a matter of education. The question is, what should they be exposed to first? Do you first tell them about the punishment? Or do you develop them to love mitzvahs and then begin to explain I to them? I agree, I don't have any, any problem with that. But right. if, you, if you read the Torah, right, the Pukatai or even Azino, it's a lot of warning from uh, Hashem Correct. Correct. of punishment. Correct. So but, we cannot say it's no punishment exists because it's, it's in the Torah. Yes, but ac see, actually you bring up another thing. So let's talk a little bit about the reward. If you talk about punishment in yes, the Torah, yes. right? If you talk about punishment in the Torah, are you also talking about the reward of the Torah? Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's what Hashem say, right? If you're so going let, to follow my law, you're going to have this one. If you're not going to so follow let, let my law... So let me tell you uh, 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 an authentic teaching. It's from the Rambam, but it's also very broad. Okay. Uh, for those of you that weren't listening, so let me tell you. Igor, yeah, no, Igor, Igor's question is as follows. Everything he's saying is really very nice, but... <laughs> <laughs> you open up the Chumash, it says, if you do this, this will happen. Yeah. If you do, don't do it, this will happen. So it sounds like that's the approach. You should tell the person, put on tefillin and you'll be healthy. If you don't put on tefillin, your cow will die. <laughs> Just <laughs> like that. Toilet, that's, what it, that, that's his question. Why don't we do that so well, much? Says in the Shema. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because so one of, I'm going to give you a answer, mm -hmm. but there are many approaches to this question. It's a good question, but there are many, many ways to, to resolve it. I'm going to give you one approach, okay? The one approach is that actually, when you read it in the Torah, it's not a reward nor, nor a punishment. Why? Because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a consequence. If yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I Listen for a second. If I tell a person who smokes three packs of, of whiskey, uh, 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 and I say, you know something, you're going to get an emphysema, or, God forbid, the lung problem, and he gets it. Is that a punishment? God punish him because... It, no, it's a consequence. If you tell a person who drinks too much, you, you know, you're killing your liver. Or for that matter, you're ruining your marriage. He says, leave it alone. And then no, things no. get from bad no, to no, worse no, no. to worse. Wrong example. Wrong example. Wrong example. Wrong example. That's wrong example. Why is it the wrong example? It's a good example. Eat more of the green stuff and drink less. Look at Yeah, yeah, yeah. We work people, right? So if you're going to drink, you're going to have problem. In 10 years, 10, 15 years, 20 years. Yeah. But eventually you're gonna have problems. So yeah, it's consequences. It's it's not the really punishment. It's not a punishment. You punish no, yourself. No one is punishing basically. you. You're punishing you're yourself. yourself. That's the whole point. But so if that, you take a hammer, you bang your foot. It's not yes. a punishment. <laughs> I mean, it's a consequence. It's yes. a, okay. So when the Torah tells us, if you do the mitzvahs, you will get rain in the season mm -hmm. and everything else. According to many great people, that's that's not a reward. Mm -hmm. That's the consequence. Well, mm -hmm. Why is it a consequence? So I'll tell you a famous teaching from the Rambam. It's just a natural consequence. Let's say, for example, um, a, 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 a simple example. Let's say you're working for a company. Okay. According to the strict letters of the law, you have to work from 9 to 12, then this, you have an hour off, whatever it is. If your supervisor came in and saw you talking on the cell phone, to your wife, to your girlfriend, to your child, to your rabbi, to your, to your doctor, you would say, well, what? what? Wait, well, look, you're supposed to be working. Okay? And he would be right. What happens if the company has a pen? You come every single day and in front of your, your workplace, it has pen and a, and a calculator, and you take it home with you. You still... Okay. If there's a company car, the company car is to be used only for for the company service. What happens if you take the company car to pick up your dry laundry? You could be fired. Okay, so I'll give you three examples about the company laws. Okay. Now, you're working for Google or Alphabet or PayPal or all these nice companies, okay? <laughs> and basically, what you're doing is, uh, you're, they see you talking on the phone. If your supervisor has any brains, the supervisor will look up your record and say, yeah, this guy's a good worker. He won't say anything about it. As a matter of fact, 
what the supervisor might do is and say, you know what, I noticed that uh, you get a little bit antsy at a quarter to 12. He says, yeah, because I have to pick up my kids. I never, take off, t take the company car. Mm. You look, company car, company car is like holy of holies. You only want to use it. It's okay. Yeah. Why is it? Now, do you <laughs> expect your salary to be deducted? No. no. This has nothing to do with salary. This has to do with like this. You're doing a good job. I want to make it as comfortable as possible for you to continue the, the good job. What happens if you're just the opposite? You're the guy that comes in exactly at 9 o'clock. You leave exactly at 3. You, you're, you, no one likes you. And you don't like the company. Everyone knows it. So the guy is looking for a, a way to fire you, you know? He's trying to find a way, to, you know, human resources. Uh, and then they find you coming home with, with, with aha, he stole. Uh, you know what I mean? Basically, because you're doing such a lousy job, he's going to hit you with every possible infraction. This is a way to look at, at when the Torah says, if you will be good, the rain will fall, Hashem is not rewarding us. Uh -huh. Hashem is saying, you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. How can I make your life a little bit easier? Uh -huh. Well, you need, you need a cow to give milk? Go give milk. You, you have to have uh, security? You'll have a lot of security. You need money? No problem. You'll be the one that's lending. You won't have to lend. Uh -huh. But if you don't listen to me, if you don't listen to me, you're drinking too much, you're smoking too much, you know what's going to happen? Pete Goya will be coming into your hand. Uh, yeah, that's what it means. So, in this case, it's not really reward and punishment. So what happens now if you tell a person like this? You know, if you don't keep Shabbos, basically, you're going to lose control of your family. Because just look at it this way. Right? You tell them very simply. You come home at 7 o'clock. Your kids came home at 4.30. They already did their homework. They're into Nintendo right now or Instagram. So they're in their own world. They don't need you. Your wife is exhausted mm. from the whole day. She doesn't need you either. <laughs> so, so this is Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Listen here, the one day of the week that they don't go to school is Saturday and Sunday. So what do you want to do? You want to go to work on Saturday? Oh gosh. You're stupid. You're retarded. You're going to lose your family and your wife. So that's not a punishment. That's you know. To lose the wife. No. He drank too much. <laughs> it's not a punishment. I think that's a natural consequence. So when you tell a person that if you'll keep Shabbos, you have a chance of 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 getting involved because there's no computer, you're not answering the phone, oh. there's no TV. Oh, you know what I mean? So basically, you're stuck with them, and they're stuck with you. Like so even if they run away from the table, you could always go upstairs. Knock on the door and tell them a story or ask how school was. Mm -hmm. doesn't always have to, by, I'm telling it to you because it doesn't always have to be by the Shabbos table. Mm -hmm. The point of it is that Shabbos is family time. But again, that's not a reward. That's a consequence. How many people will... Have you ever heard a person... Have you ever heard, uh, uh, hear an expression, he's going through hell? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does that mean, he's going through hell? And all the circumstances of his life are getting him into like uh, troubles and more troubles, more tzuras. Okay, you know something? So hell doesn't have to be up there. Mm -hmm. Might then, be sure. Yeah, there's hell on earth. And believe it or not, there's also Gan Eden on, on yeah. earth. Unfortunately, many of us have that Gan Eden, we just don't even realize it mm -hmm. until we lose it. You understand? So when a person gets sick, God forbid, when the kids get sick, God forbid, one of his wives, his wife gets sick, so then suddenly mm. he realized how good it was and now how everything is not going. But it's still from God. Saying of course. Has, you know, saying but it's but not the ultimate. Like if you do but sick, this is term terminology it's only. It's what? It's from the God yeah. perspective, yeah. it's uh, right. it's not punishment. It's not it's punishment. Consequent. From a like human pros yeah, perspective, it's punishment. Not necessarily. But, uh, if it's not necessarily if, if punishment. Pro if prophecies say, you're not going to follow my law, the temple is going to be destroyed, right? And it's happened, it's destroyed. So what is that? From, hu from human perspective, it's a punishment, right? It's not uh, from, from God view, probably it's consequence. That's how he makes the world. Yeah, but it's still punishment. <laughs> but again, but even that you could argue with. If it was only punishment, we should have had back the temple by now. 
between the first temple and the second temple is only 70 years. But we didn't come back to... No, that's not the reason why. And it's also, think of it this way. Ask yourself a simple question. If you were God, okay, and you want the people to go do Teshuva, would you keep them in exile where they're getting more and more assimilated? Of course, it doesn't make any sense. So it can't be only a punishment. It's actually a reward in its own way. Now, it's, Hashem wants the best for His people, and what's best for His people at this time is Golos. Oh. I, I have a question. Yeah. You said uh, <coughs> if everything is a consequence, right? Uh, if you do good, you see the good things. I mean, you know. I said that was one approach. Right, 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 I didn't right. say it's the only approach. I said it was well, one approach. Like, if you're a full guy, what a full person who believes in God, and you know, know something about it, so obviously you can understand that. If I do good, put it fill on, down with a million, do what I have to do, you know, by the rabbi or whatever, by the right. rabbi, I'm supposed to get good. The consequence is going to be, you know, everything's supposed to be good. Not, so, not necessary. No, I mean, or if it doesn't happen to be good, at least I have to look inside myself, so if I have to do something actually here and there. So, it's only worse if you're a guy, right? Not necessarily. If, if you're not... Uh, if you're just an ordinary person, you kind of like do something that happens, you feel like it's like, it's just because Chance. I went to university, no, you know, I got a degree, right. just, I, I'm smart, I got a job, right. I got paid, not because I put a film on, not, it, it's, yeah. not, it comes in that, I work for it, I work for it. <laughs> so Correct. there's no like, you know what I mean, so there's uh, But those people, when, when they're How late, do you really what? let them see... Because by simply showing, the, the expression is, King, Sa- King Solomon said, the, I forget all the Hebrew, but there are like five things he says. I'll t- I remember three of them. Not always people that are wise have bread. Not all people that are strong win. And not all people that are fast win the race. So let's just talk about for a minute, Chacham. It ha- it's not hard to show a reality, which is that there. Are, if you take a look at how many, how many people went through law school, okay? Mm-hmm. Just for argument's sake, it's not an easy thing to do. So mm-hmm. we're talking about a high level of intelligence. And you take a look of how many of them are actually practicing lawyers, and then look how many of them actually made it and then look how many are actually satisfied with it and begin to realize that it's only a small fraction. If you take a look about how many people uh, graduated in the 1980s with an MBA, a Master of Business was an association. Administration. Administration. Every one of them thought that they're going to be hired by Wall Street. And they're driving taxis, Uber. (laughs) (laughs) Cheapest, cheapest, cheapest. It's not funny. They're making no, more money, money with Uber than anything yeah, else. Yeah. And they say, where did my masters go? Mm-hmm. You understand? And you find other people, they're doing yoga, and, and they're becoming personal trainers. This guy is a genius. Okay, so that's a reality. <clears throat> so you're saying, so you could show a person <sighs> that, look, you want to say it's all you? Fine, but you're mistaken. Because statistics don't prove, yeah. prove it. I, I agree. It's like we're talking about so, different kind of people, right? So, so different type of people. Approach. Yeah, yeah. You're, talking, you're talking about approach, right? Mindset. So again, mindset. the the art mindset, right? The truth of the matter is, again, you, I would use it in a different way. If a person says, you know, I don't need Hashem um, because I'm so successful, one of my approaches would be, could you imagine if you had his his help? How much more successful you would be? <laughs> that is, if you're an ambitious guy, <laughs> so then hanging out with God is, is a very good thing. But there's, there's enough in Yiddishkeit. Again, a person, it, when you approach a person, I, I, okay. No, so most of the time, when probably you see somebody, or well, looks like you, like, I mean, just in general, a person really goes to or approaches to God, it has to show them, you know, so to say, well, like, something happens. In this case, it's like, it's uh, very generic. Something happens, something goes wrong, <laughs> you go to rabbi. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to God and say, please help me, you know. Nobody goes to God when everything works, it's fine, you know. So it doesn't have to be... 
you know, you have to go through what the hell in order to well, there are people, the gods. But, but the truth of the matter is there are people that go to the rabbi for bar mitzvah, bas mitzvah, and weddings, and that's not because of hell. Okay, so I... Okay, you understand? Know no, I'm just saying, you have to, you have to keep yeah, it in mind. Right, right, there right, are right. times, okay. there are times, okay. Uh, let me, let me yeah, point out yeah. in general right. an, an approach, which is true from Chabad, but it's true for, for everyone. Yes! I heard this no. actually, I, I actually heard this story from, 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 from Manus Friedman. Mm -hmm. He tells the story that when he was a bacha, he was not married. I heard from him. He said when he wasn't married, uh, in the late, which it's interesting, it just it was just in the news that Lakewood, New Jersey, not Lakewood, New Jersey, you know what it's called? The Garden State. The Garden and actually, uh -huh. yeah, they're bringing we'll back farms. Actually, we went up yeah. over a thousand yeah. farms, specialty farms. Um, yeah. It's interesting. But anyway, in his days, there was a whole thing of Merkishlichas where the Bakram would go to farms. There were a lot of farms in the 1950s and early 60s. Um, and they would go to the farmers and basically uh, bring uh, tefillin and mezuzahs and svarim and everything else. He says, he used to go, he didn't tell me, the, I don't remember the place, but I remember him telling the story. So uh, he said it was in New Jersey and there was like a, a, a settlement of Jewish farmers. And, and uh, essentially, uh, they had a shtickle rabbi. He wasn't the rabbi rabbi, but he was the most learned. He, he led the service. And he was, uh, some of them had gone through the Holocaust, some of them were not. Anyway, they looked very much forward to these two young yeshiva boys who used to come and parade with them. Mm -hmm. He said he learned an amazing thing. The rabbi, there was a Holocaust survivor who was basically uh, a nervous wreck. He never, he never recovered. And the only thing that calmed them was playing cards. He would play cards. He was always looking for people to play cards with. And he said, you know, forget, the rabbi used to always play cards with him. And it was like a real mitzvah. You understand mm -hmm. what? Some people need uh, medicine. He needed cards. Anyway, what happened was, um, when the boys came, <coughs> the older guys got up in a line to put on film. And this nervous Meshuggah, Really, should be not not in a derogatory way, in, in a psychological way. He was really a little crazy. He had gone through hell on earth, you know, and he was nervous always. And he was playing gods. He didn't want to put on film. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, you know, Manus does his thing on him. You know why you should put on film and this and that. And he was thinking about a little, little boy. Until finally, I think he said, could be I don't remember all the details, but I think he said the rabbi that played cards with him went over the sense and said, Yanko. Bista yid or the bista goy? Are you a Jew or are you a goy? There you go. He said, I'm a Jew. He <laughs> says, Lake Trillum, I yid Lake Trillum. <laughs> no, 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 it's a very powerful it. statement. Yeah. You understand? There's no logic for this. That's he went straight to the gut. You. If you're a Jew, you put on film. Not, there's no <laughs> reasons why you put on film. And then if you're angry with God, it doesn't yeah. make a difference. You're a Jew, you put on film. That approach of going straight to the neshama is always the most effective way. It's always the most effective way. When you don't go to the mind, the mind comes secondary or third, and you don't even go to the heart, which is also secondary. You, you, you start straight with... Uh, some people have pointed out, you know, in terms of marketing, the, the mitzvah tank had the worst marketing approach in the world. And I'm speaking from experience. I was one of the tech system. I used to be a lot better than I am today. A lot of what? Tank yeah, one, one of the people that went on the tanks. They called them keys. They used yeah, to drive tankies. the yeah. bits for tanks. Yeah, someone yeah. 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 that was on the tank. Where did you go? Okay. To Manhattan? I went to Manhattan, I went to Brooklyn, I went to a lot of places. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't any different. I was a whole group of guys, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I was a tank yeah. 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 So I, But I have to tell you, the approach was such a terrible mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. And they still use it today. What do you think the approach is? You stand outside. You say, are you Jew? Excuse me, <laughs> are you Jewish? Yeah. <laughs> it's basically as a PR. You can tell. It's the worst thing. First of are all, you black? are you like this exactly? Guy? It's, it's <laughs> offensive. It's offensive. It's, 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 it's anyway, intrusive. Are you Jewish? They do that on college campuses too. Are you Jewish? College rap. Uh, I'm telling you, it's it's really do that. as a PR. It's the worst. Yeah. And we always used to try to think of something cute, like yeah. uh, you got a minute or give your hand for Israel. You know, 
The, it always went back to, are you Jew? <coughs> and it was really, some people actually said, you're not allowed to do that. Why? Yeah. Because if the Jew says no, he actually denied being Jewish. Right. Mm -hmm. So you caused him to sin. Others disagreed about that. But it, you know what I mean? It, you make the guy really feel uncomfortable. So usually they would, yeah, the, 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 those that, those were, he used to say, not today. So then we already understood. He's Jewish, but he doesn't want to act Jewish. Like. But the reality is that that statement really cuts through all of the BS in this world. So if you say, are you religious? Are you orthodox? Uh, have you heard of bar mitzvah? You know what I mean? There's so many more polite ways. Yeah, yeah. Are you one of us? You know, that's like, are you a member of the faith? You know, there's a lot of stuff, you know, you could make up. And they're all good. None of them gets to the heart as, are you Jewish or not? So if the guy says, yes, but not today, you know, or something stupid like that, and the response is, Judaism is forever. If the guy says, yes, but I'm not religious, like, that's fine, you don't have to be. All you have to do is be Jewish. Because it goes, you know what I'm saying? I heard something yeah. once about my wife told me, one of the Chabad rabbis she, she met once, somebody asked him, uh, I'm not into organized religion. <laughs> We're not so organized. And actually, it's easy. I've never organized. Are you Jewish? Yes, put it to like, no, why not? There's no reason not to, right? So, so basically, I mean, it doesn't always work. A lot of it has to do with sincerity. You have to present it in a sincere way. You know, there's a lot, lot the, there are many factors that go into it. Mm. But the point of it is that it goes straight to the heart. Mm. It really does. It goes because everything else you could you you could dance around. Am I orthodox? Am I religious? Am I do? I, do you believe in God? You know all this type of stuff. But you can't deny. Am I Jewish? Am I not Jewish? Once you say I'm, I'm Jewish, that affirmation automatically leads you to. So if I'm Jewish, what am I supposed to do with it? You know what does that mean? So actually, even those that have maybe loved ones that are not religious, you say, but you're Jewish. Yeah. And if they don't deny it, you know, if they don't deny it, then they have to deal with it. <laughs> Which is very different than saying, but you're not religious. Okay, not religious. And saying, but not being Jewish is, is some... You know what you saw it also very interesting in a completely different way? You saw it by, if you remember the story of the Mir Yehudi, this goes back at least 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. But basically, uh, the law of return, mm -hmm. you know, to become an American citizen, if you're a foreigner, it means you have to wait five years and a whole bunch of stuff. But if you're coming from Afghanistan or France or America or the Ukraine, and you're Jewish, you could become an, Ameri uh, an Israeli citizen overnight. Mm -hmm which is a beautiful concept. It's called the, the law of return. Mm -hmm. What happened was, in the early 60s, or late 60s, mm -hmm. what happened was that um, there was a big scandal. What had happened was that there was a guy, his name was Reverend Daniels. Right. Yeah. And he was married. Uh, <clears throat> he was married, I, I think he was married to a guy. He lived in Israel, and his two kids, were in the Israeli army. When one of them was killed, they did not want to bury him in a Jewish cemetery. And a big thing broke out in Israel. Big, big thing that, how could you not bury them in, in a Jewish cemetery? They're more Jewish than all the Jews in, the, in America. They don't want to come, you know. And he, he, he's a biblical guy, he was a reverend, you know, and then he, he, he raised his kids to, to believe in, in, in the God of Israel. But he was a guy. Anyway, what happened was that that scandal caused that there was a, a reading in the Knesset where they had to define what is a Jew. Mm -hmm. So they put down that the only people that are Jewish are those that are born of a Jewish mother or those that have converted. Mm -hmm. When that happened, the Lavach Rebbe immediately picked up on the word converted. It doesn't say how they converted. It has to say converted according to Jewish law. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just converted... Essentially, anyone can convert anyone. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that uh, the Rebbe started a fight and a war. He did not win, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but he, I mean, and he, he, the, the, this consumed him. 
-hmm. because he said that if we're going to have Goyim coming into Israel, mm -hmm. what happened was that when 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 many many Russian emigrants came, they came, they were told say to the spouse, say you're Jewish, and someone said we're not Jewish. Why don't we Jewish? So then come take two classes and we'll give you a stempel that you're Jewish. And basically, it's been estimated just the most recently, almost a third of Russian people oh. in Russia in Israel, Israel today are not halachically Jewish. Mm, great. Which is a tremendous terrible thing. Yeah, but still they had um, I, I had so, friends that like, work actually you know, used to go to Russia if somebody dies in Israel. Right. You know, especially if you're Russian, if you don't have your um, uh, you know, birth certificate, you know, go back like the silent or like original or be like issued like as a new one in the 90s. At, at least like, you know, in the 90s, they said that we, until you prove that you are Jewish, especially like according to the like, Orthodox stuff. So, so people used to go back to Russia and look for a proof that you are a Jewish. It was like some crazy stories, mm -hmm. you know, about like how to find a Jew, but like, actually they start worried about it, like, um, you know, how yeah, can we really... Long you it's know. a terrible thing. The bottom I mean, it line still is, happens, I guess. it still so, happens. Yeah, it happens yeah. with with everyone. So that because yeah. they didn't put down the it's word kahalacha, ka, kahalacha. But they, they and, didn't eventually. It's still that. No, it's, it's still it's still that. Yeah, the was so disappointed because uh, I don't want to go into this. It was very painful for the Rebbe then and now, mm -hmm. and actually the repercussions are being felt today as well. Yeah, the Rebbe also said that when when a person um, takes away the the separation between Jews and non-Jews, that is, all non-Jews are considered Jews if they say so, then that will take away the, the separation between Israel and outside of Israel, and essentially between the enemies of Israel and the people of Israel. And actually, during that time, uh, that's when the PLO began to grow. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it doesn't make it there. The, so, I forget really why I brought it in, but the idea is, once a person is Jewish, there's a certain amount of behavior that, that, that you could expect. So the most important thing is to acknowledge this Tayyid, so this Nish Tayyid. Are you Jewish or aren't you? Once you say, you establish you're a Jew, the whole language and the whole communication changes. This is the way Jewish people act, because that's the way you're supposed to act. That's the, you don't have to go for it, you don't have to understand it. Let's make a little time for that. Okay, you have to make a little time for that. <laughs> <laughs> we, have to, that we have a minion, right? Yeah, we have a humidity minion. You made a minion? Whoa. Oh, yes. Just made a minion. Okay. You know, today is actually a, a good time. Yeah. I mean, it's better for me if you read a finish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yiddish. See, that's what happens when you go to yeah. do a mitzvah, you get that's another one. That's what happens one. when you live in America. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what does the people speak English? I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm you know, today is the seventh day of, uh, of, of Cheshvah. Tonight's loss is actually number eight. Oh, today's eight. Yeah. What happened today in Israel? No. I'm not talking about politically. Halachically, today it was the time that they would mm -hmm. ask for rain. Oh. The question is... We already mentioned oh, rain. But it's only in Israel, uh, it's not in America, right? Not in America, no. Like in December, it's not in December. Right. But in, we already mentioned rain on Shmini Atzeres. Mm -hmm. So why don't we ask for rain until two weeks later? It's the journey. Right. So the Talmud gives the answer that it took two weeks for the furthest Jew to leave Israel. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to oh, inconvenience yeah. the traveler. So the Rebbe pointed out very much this idea that, imagine, there are farms in Jerusalem, farms in the north, farms of... All of these people that need the rain were willing not to take the rain because they did not want to inconvenience a fellow Jew who lives... So really, Zion Adar is a symbol of, in a sense, of... I'm sorry, correct. Zion Cheshvan is a symbol really of Abbas Yisrael. So what's the abbreviation? Look in the calendar, it says, um, what is it, like two letters? You abbreviated this. How do, you know, the calendar, right? Yeah. Is that something? Yeah, Tal says Umata, something. maybe it says. No, 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 it doesn't say Tal Umata. It says like actually three letters. Hmm. And I put no? it, I don't know. It does, in, in your calendar. Okay, I, I, know, I, I know. Zion Cheshvan, yeah. Actually, okay. Zion so that's Zion Cheshvan, but, but I read a Sikha <laughs> today <laughs> where the Rebbe adds something very interesting to it, and that is the holiday season ended today. Oh. Why? Because in the holiday season, basically, uh, was the time when all the Jews were in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. 
And then when the last, until the last Jew left, it was still, so to speak, yuntiv like mm -hmm. And so the idea of making this world a world for God actually begins tonight and tomorrow. That, that starts the, the and, and he writes that whenever you start something, you have to start it with joy. So there has to be a lot of, <laughs> a lot of symbolism.